know, it's good. It's good when we realize our need for the Lord, isn't it? No, there's a world that needs him that don't even know they need him. When we get to the point where we realize we need him, it's to our advantage. It's sweet to be able to see how God is here, how he's working, how he's already uh, met people where they're at, he's working in their lives. We need the Lord. The world needs the Lord. We have these beautiful um, decorations here, thanks to a, a beautiful wedding ordained under God last night between Bianca and Jamal. It was great. Um, Brother Jacob, Sister Renee, it was a beautiful wedding. We are, our blessings, our wishes go to them. It was good to see how people could meet God in a time of prayer, just as they are. And God has what they need. We need him, and he has what he needs, what we need. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, Brother Don had mentioned already that Pastor Doyce and Sister Suzanne are on vacation this week. And um, I was thinking um, on the message this morning, and, you know, I think pastors would appreciate, and Pastor Doyce might appreciate, and he might even be watching right now. So hi, Pastor Doyce. You're watching live streaming. A few weeks ago, uh, he talked about uh, what we could expect to discover in our closet, to find in our closet. Remember that? And he, he talked about our, our prayer closet and going daily to a, a precious time of prayer and that, that closet of prayer with God. And you remember he said what we could find? He said we could find a, a treasure of great value, like a pearl of great price. He said we could find a passion for prayer that would uh, intensify our relationship with God, that would that give us a warm experience with God. He said we could, among other things, we could even find our soulmate in that closet of prayer. I'd like for us to, mirror, and I think pastors would, would like that we would uh, delve into the message that God had given them before. So maybe we can explore a little bit more this closet, this idea of our closet and what God would have for us there and how we would come out of our closet dressed the way that God would have us to come out of the closet. You know, I think uh, the world has an idea of what coming out of the closet is that might not be exactly what God has in mind for how we should come out of the closet boldly with the way God would have us to be dressed. Let's look at that a little bit today. Let me introduce you uh, to some folks in a fashion show of sorts that uh, maybe could give us an idea of, of how we could come out dressed. Our uh, first person that will be uh, coming across the stage here. This is a uh, chameleon, chameleon Christian. Now, a uh, chameleon Christian, uh, maybe she uh, dresses in layers and maybe different colors of ways that she can uh, fit into or maybe just kind of uh, at the drop of a hat or a pickup of a hat can kind of blend into the surroundings that she's in according to the people she's around. If she's at work or if she's at church or if she's at uh, the ball field with her kids or, or wherever she might be, she blends in to the people that she's around. The chameleon Christian. Maybe um, never really um, changing or always wanting to change their lifestyle and their values from place to place, depending on who they're around. Now, the next Christian we have, we'll be coming in our show here, is uh, you may think he might resemble a little bit the chameleon Christian based on his uh, camouflage fatigues. Maybe he kind of uh, blends in. But no, that's not really the idea of this guy. This is a foxhole Christian, the foxhole Christian. Now, his motto would be, you've heard it before, that uh, there are no atheists in the foxhole, right? Everyone believes in God. And, and his deal would be that he calls out to God, he believes in God in times of crisis, when there's a real need, he calls out on God, and that's really about the only time you hear or see him is in that crisis time when he calls out to God in the foxhole. When, when the going gets rough, you'll hear him call out for God. And then our next uh, Christian coming across this platform here is the Colgate Christian. Now, the Colgate Christian uh, always has a, uh, you know, the, the big 
big grin, beautiful smile, but I wonder sometimes if that smile is hiding something that's underneath. Maybe she thinks that she always has to put on a front, put on a mask to cover up what's in there. And this Christian, wow, when we come to church, we should be able to be who we really are. If any place in the world, we should be able to come and let down those chains. Maybe those things that are binding us, that are, that are keeping us from, you know, we're not promised a perfect life. Now, we can be victorious in that, and we can go through it and have victory, but sometimes we just put up that big phony grin and hide behind that of what's really, what we're really dealing with when other Christians can help us along the way. Thank you, Colgate Christian. All right, then we have, then we have the secret agent Christian. Now, the secret agent Christian, he believes his faith is a private matter. It should be lived privately, not in the public arena. So he lives in secret service to his king. He doesn't want to blow his cover and let anyone else know about his identity in Christ. And then we have the saint Christian, the saintly Christian. Now, the saint Christian, oh, oh, good saint Christian, oh, uh, hello. How art thou this morning? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, thanks. Glory to God. <laughs> well, I hate to rush, but I must be going. The oh. least of these are in need. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> the saintly Christian carries the big cross, the big Bible, and he's maybe thinks of himself a little bit above regular Christians, right? Uh, must be on his way to do, to serve the least of these. Maybe he's a super spiritual language, um, a, a super committed Christian. Now, these Christians, thank y'all very much. Y'all give them a, a hand as, as they uh, exit the stage. <laughs> what would God have us to wear? Now, have you ever said, I'll never wear that? Have you ever said that, I'll never wear that? When you saw a style or a trend, be careful what you say. I've seen people who said they would never wear that come out with those high-waisted jeans that they thought they'd never wear again. And those, um, you know, leg, uh, leg warmers. Remember leg warmers? Oh, ladies, you think you'll ever wear those again? Let's be careful what we say we'll never wear. Is this what God intends Christians to wear? You remember there was a show a few years ago on TLC called What Not to Wear? What Not to Wear, it was pretty humorous to see that. But maybe this could have been a display of God's what not to wear. What not to wear. Maybe you can identify with some of these. Now God does have something for us to wear. But what? Colossians 3.12, Chris, I think you might have that one for me, tells us a little bit. You know, the Scripture is full of things that he gives us insight about what we can wear, what we're to put on, what we're to come out of our closet wearing when we enter into the world. Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You know, that's just one scripture. We'll get to some more in a minute. But God has something. Our Heavenly Father has something for us to come out of the closet wearing in this world that we're in. We were in uh, Oklahoma City uh, this past week, and one of the speakers that was there in one of the venues was Francis Chan. And you may have heard of him or read some of his books or seen uh, some of his sermons online or something. But uh, he was sharing with us, and I think I have this right, he was telling us about his children. He said he has children ranging from, I believe this is right, 19 years old down to six months old. He said, I have it all. <laughs> wow. Would you like to have it all? 
And if that means having it all, I don't know if I want that. A grown child all the way to one in diapers. Can you remember having a child in diapers? Maybe you have a child in diapers right now. I remember Micah, I'll embarrass him now, when Micah was in diapers and how he grew up out of that stage and he was no longer in diapers and, and uh, Rebecca was kind of sad about it because he, she thought he was so cute in a diaper. You know, we got, you all have pictures of your kids in diapers and, you know, they're so cute. But as we uh, grow up and get older, it's not quite so cute anymore, is it? If you're wearing a diaper, if you see a uh, seven or eight-year-old up here wearing a diaper, or if you see a uh, 70 year old, now sometimes they have to wear diapers, but that's another story. But you wouldn't want to see it, would you? But as you um, mature, you grow out of the diaper stage, don't you? At one point in your life, you're a babe and you wear a diaper. But that's not the intention to stay in the diaper. It's not so cute anymore after a while. We have to grow up out of that. People notice what we're wearing. If you ever watch the Emmys or something like that, that's what the buzz is all about on the media. They were wearing this or they were wearing that. And sometimes they more notice what we're not wearing, right? There comes a time to grow up out of diapers. Would you agree that there are some Christians? Uh oh. <laughs> there are some Christians still wearing diapers. That should have already gotten to the point where they've grown past that. God's design for us is to mature and grow, not to stay in diapers. A lot of babies wear diapers. Some of you parents who've had babies that wear diapers, you know why, don't they? They lack self-control. Babies are really good at making messes, aren't they? I think we can apply this to Christians. Somebody asked me one time, what are you good at doing? I said, well, I'm good at making messes. <laughs> I'm good at making that. As an immature baby Christian, typically we tend to lack self-control to some extent. Often we make a mess of things, don't we? But by God's grace and by our intentional efforts to be obedient and faithful, God helps to grow us up, to grow us up and to, we mature past that baby stage. But we have to be intentional about practicing self-control and allowing God's spirit control in our life. God will honor our effort in practicing self-control. Second Peter chapter 1 gives us some hints as to how we are to mature as God intends. And uh, Chris, I think you'll have that. Miss Julie, where's Micah? Is he in here? Micah, you come up. Miss Julie, if you'll come up and read this scripture for me. Second Peter chapter 1 gives us some hints as how we are to mature. And how he does it, he reads it, it's kind of like dressing in layers. You ever uh, dress your kids in layers? They're about to go out into the, into the elements, and you want to dress them in layers, right? Chris, I'm going to give Miss Julie this to read. Number six. For this, right. For this very reason... Make every effort to add to your faith. Oh, here's a man of faith right here. Goodness. He's got his faith. He wants to put a little goodness on, right? We'll add a layer of goodness to it. All right. And to goodness, knowledge. Knowledge. We'll add a little knowledge to his faith and his goodness. And to knowledge, self-control. All right, let's get this jacket on you. A little self-control there. And to self-control, perseverance. Oh, yeah, we'll get this around you. You'll be wrapped up real good, okay? All right, turn this way there and see you. And to perse perseverance, godliness. Let's see. Get you a little godliness here. <clears throat> Keep reading. And to godliness, mutual affection. 
affection. All right. And to mutual affection, love. Love. <laughs> love covers all, doesn't it? And our faith, thank you, Miss Julie. You can stay here just for a minute. We have to put a little, he's hot, he says. <laughs> well, we got some air blowing up here. To our faith, we can't just stop at our faith. Our faith, our, our good works don't uh, gain us our faith. Our faith in Christ gains us everything that we have in him. But uh, to that faith, we need to grow up in our faith. And uh, in First Peter, we're told to grow up in that. In Second Peter, I'm sorry. We're to add to some things to it. We're to add the um, moral excellence. We're to add knowledge. We're to add self-control. We're to add perseverance and add godliness and add brotherly kindness and add love. And as we're adding these things, I believe God is telling us to grow in faith. We must do something. We must have action to put on, put on certain things. What would God have us to put on? We get a, a little example of that in 1 Peter. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> you can, you can uh, go shed your clothes there. I wanted to read uh, just the commentary that was in my Bible that had to do with that, about what uh, we read in 1 Peter. It says, faith must be more than belief in certain facts. It must result in action, growth in Christian character and the practice of moral discipline, or it will die away. Peter lists several of faith's actions, learning to know God better, developing perseverance, doing God's will and loving others, and so on. These actions do not come automatically. They require hard work. We have to add some action, some work, some intentional diligence to our faith to be able to mature past the baby stage of our faith. I'll read this other paragraph and we'll move on from that. Our faith must, bo must go beyond what we believe. It must become a dynamic part of all we do, resulting in good fruit and spiritual maturity. Salvation does not depend on good works, but it results in good works. Our salvation, a result of that salvation should be good works. And that involves some doing, some putting on, some action on our part. A person who claims to be sa saved while remaining unchanged does not understand faith or what God has done for him. So how do we get out of the diapers? We add to our faith these things. We do something. We take action. We work. We work at putting on some of these things that Peter talked about, moral excellence, perseverance, self-control, etc. And we mature out of the diapers. God has more for us, and he wants us to grow to resemble Christ. But to do this, he demands our discipline and our effort. We have to go beyond our beginning faith and add some action. As we obey Christ, we will develop self-control and these other characteristics and mature as God intends for us. So what's God, God have in store for you to wear? Ephesians 6.10 is another example, and it'll be a familiar passage to you. I'd like, uh, is Drew in the house? Drew, can you come forward? Miss Rebecca, will you help him? Let's get a picture of what we read in Ephesians of what we're to wear, what God has for us to put on. Ephesians 6, chapter 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the what? Full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, 
so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and altar, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, he looks a little different now, doesn't he? He's taken on the full armor of God. <laughs> so what does God have for us to put on? What does he have for us to wear? Well, we've gone from babies in a diaper to warriors. Warriors. Do you understand that we're in a battle? I don't think you have to look very far to see we're in a battle. God has armor for us to put on because he knows we're in a battle. He wants us to grow up out of the baby stage of wearing our diapers and be ready for the battlefront. We have a battle to be fought, and God has the armor for us to wear in it. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. You can go on down. This scripture tells us we're fighting against spiritual forces, and we need to put on God's armor. You know, I think we can kind of pick our battles sometimes based on things that come at us that are in our face, maybe things you see on the news, things that just kind of ruffle your feathers. But that's not what our battle's against. Our battle is against something much deeper, that spiritual forces. Are you ready to get out of the diaper? Come on. You ready to get out of the diaper and put your armor on? There's a battle to be fought, and God has something for you to wear. The belt of truth. There's a world out there who's believed a lot of lies for way too long about themselves, about the reality of what they think things, the way they think things should be. They believe lies that are killing them. They're entrapping them. They're enslaving them in lifestyles that God never intended them to be in. There's a world out there who's been lied to by an enemy that this scripture that we read about in Ephesians is telling us to suit up against. With the belt of truth, we've got to be suited up and ready to speak the truth. Speak the truth to this world. Speak the truth to the people who have been lied to for so long they don't know what real truth is. Be ready to speak the truth to them in love. In love. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. We just sang a song, my one defense, my righteousness. It's not my righteousness, not from acts that I've done, but from what Christ has put on me. His righteousness is my only defense. The breastplate of righteousness that comes from Christ. The foot gear ready to spread the good news. The shield of faith to protect us from the arrows of Satan. The helmet of salvation. The sword of the Spirit, our offensive weapon, the Word of God. You can't do that wearing a diaper. We've got to grow up. God's depending on us. Maybe not so much the world is depending on us, whether they know it or not. And God wants to use us as his instruments to be able to reach the world for him that's dying. God has something for you to wear. Let's get suited up for action. Don't be content to sit at home with the babies when God's got a place for you on the front line, on the battlefront. Would you believe that God even has more for you to wear? Romans 13, verses 12 and verse 14 says, 
The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. In verse 14, it said, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Clothe yourselves with what? With Jesus. Clothe yourself with Christ. That's what the title is this morning. Put on Christ. God has something for you to wear. Put on Christ. Clothe yourselves with Christ. Galatians 3, 27 uh, says it a little different way, but uh, similar. He says, for all of, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. But for that wardrobe to work, you got to take off some other things, don't you? Husbands, how many of you have heard these words? You're going to wear that? Okay, I'm guilty. <laughs> um, you know, um, maybe we don't tend to always have the great sense of what matches and what goes together. But uh, we, thank goodness we have our wives that can help us with that. Uh, Micah has uh, grown to have this good sense of what goes together. Uh, yeah, and he'll even come to Rebecca sometimes. Does this go together? You know, because he knows he'll have to go change if it doesn't. But, but some things, you know, just don't go together. And it said, lay aside the deeds of darkness. Put on the armor of light. It said to um, put off the old clothes, the deeds of darkness. And it goes on, if you want to read in Galatians 3, it gives a whole list of things that are, fall in that category. It said, put on Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. It says, uh, when you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It's like saying to put our old way of life behind us like like old clothes to be thrown away. You ever just gone through your closet and just got some old clothes and just thrown them away or maybe given them to a, a Goodwill or something like that? But your old clothes, you said, this isn't me anymore. I'm putting them off. I'm throwing them away. Do you like getting brand new clothes? It just does something to you, doesn't it? To be able to put brand new clothes on. Maybe it gives you a little uh, skip in your step and you can puff your chest up a little bit. But it feels good to have new clothes on. It just does something to you. Now, why would we go back to putting our old, dirty, ripped, stinky clothes that we have out for the garbage? Why would we go back to putting those on when we have new clothes of righteousness that God for has for us? Clothed with Christ. Wow. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us a little bit about this Christ. Oh, he's a great Christ. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He became sin. We became righteousness. What a trade. What a trade. I see uh, Sherry back there with her girls. And uh, girls, I don't know if you know this, but she's confessed to me that sometimes she shares your clothes from your closet. So, um, so I guess they have a deal going where they trade clothes out. And, um, uh, you know, she has beautiful daughters. They have great wardrobe. And they just they, uh, trade clothes out. And uh, I'm sure you've seen her wearing some pretty dresses that she stole from Hannah or Haley. But, uh, maybe not necessarily stole. You might have had something to do with the acquisition of it, didn't you? But, um, but a trade. What about our trade with Christ? When we trust Christ, we make an exchange. Our sin for his righteousness. Our sin was poured onto Christ on the cross. It was poured into him. At his crucifixion, his righteousness is poured into us at our conversion as we trust in him. 
We try to, I think Chris even alluded to this earlier, we try to fix ourselves up first and then accept Christ. It doesn't work that way. We could never make it right. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Filthy rags, dirty, dingy, stained, ripped, torn, ragged clothes. That's what our righteous acts are. We can't fix ourselves up. We can't make ourselves right. But Christ's righteousness, the righteousness of Christ that we accept covers all that and makes us, the scripture says, as white as snow, as white as snow. This is what is meant by Christ's atonement for sin. Trading as we know it, like we talked about Sherry and her girls back there, trading as we know it usually only works when two people exchange goods of relatively equal value. You know what I mean? We, we find something that we would be willing, it would be similar in value and we would trade it. But God, but God offers to trade his righteousness for our sin. No comparison. Something of immeasurable worth for something, something completely worthless except unto death. How great is our God? How kind and gracious and compassionate is our God? To be clothed with Christ. Now, when we go to our closets in the morning, as Pastor Doyce preached to us about a few weeks ago, we go to our closets in the morning, we spend some alone time with God. Do we make that daily conscious commitment to leave the old clothes thrown away and walk out clothed with the righteousness that is in Christ? We put on Christ. So why? So those who cross our path on a daily basis, cross our path during the day, they need what only Christ has to offer them, whether they know it or not. They need Christ. We put him on so that they can see Christ when they look at us. We're wearing him. Are we? Are we wearing him? If there's an injured person who needs a doctor, they're stumbling in into the hospital, they're going to be looking for the guy in the white coat, not the guy pushing the dirty mop bucket, right? They're looking, what are you wearing? What are you wearing? Hurting people are looking for Christ. Have you put him on? Are you wearing Christ? So people see what they're looking for when they look at you. What are you wearing? Have you thrown out the old clothes for the good and now wearing the white robe of righteousness that Christ has for you? No matter what you've done, no matter what you've done, you can be made right. I think some of you are already made right this morning. Thank God. There's no timetable for that other than his. No matter what you've done, you can be made right. It can be covered except Christ's white robe. Have you come out of your closet sporting what God would have you to wear? Have you clothed yourself with Christ? Have you added to your faith by dressing in the layers that we displayed here earlier? The layers of moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Love, of all the virtues, what it say, the greatest of these is love. How about love? You may say, well, down deep, I have a love for everybody. I love everybody. In my heart of hearts, I really care about the world, and I, I love them. I will love the world around me. But what about your outer garments? What's showing on the outside to the world about that love that you say you have? Do they see the love you claim to have? 
Colossians 3, 12, and 14. I read verse 12 earlier at the beginning, but I want to read verses 12 through 14 now. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Think about that when you're thinking about how you're loving people around you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Put on love. You might say, well, how can I put on the armor and also put on love? I'm in a battle. I'm not out here just in a love fest. God does it, doesn't he? He fought for us. He died for us. We're in a battle, but we'll also be loving. Love people around us. Put on love. Put it on. Wear it out. And I don't mean wear it out like it's going to wear out, like it's going to go away, but I mean wear it on the outside. Wear it out. You can't wear it out. What does 1 Corinthians 13 say? Love bears all things, endures all things, and it never fails. You can't wear it out, but wear it on the outside for all to see. It needs to be seen. The world needs to see it. The world needs it. Love. Put it on. For if we're to put on Christ, if we're to be Christ to the world we're in, the world that's desperately in need of Christ. If we're to put on Christ, we're to put on beyond all else, it said, love. The musicians will come forward. I'll be closing up. To be the church that God intends for us to be and that the world needs for us to be, to exhibit Christ to the world, we're going to have to love and love boldly Love boldly. Love in a way that observers and onlookers will notice that there's something different about us, different about the church. They will know us by our love. It'll be something that will draw them to it, that they'll be drawn to and they'll be pointed to Christ. People will see God when we love each other. 1 John 4.12 said, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And when people see that, they'll see God. They'll see God. We got to love each other. We got to love each other. As we love one another, the God of love who lives in us will be seen by the world who needs him so much. The world has been fed a lot of lies about what love is. There's a lot of confusion about real love. As the song says, I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. Whether they know it or not, we, the church, we can show them. We can show them. We can't show them the kind of love they think they're looking for, but we can show them the real love, the real love of Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father not an artificial love that they believed the lies of the enemy for about for so long, but real love. And we can show them. We can put on many things, church, but above all, let's put on love. Put on love. It's God's plan for a dying world. Let's be the church he's called us to be and love each other and love the people that are dying around us. Let's stand. Let's stand together in unity, in love with each other. Thinking about